Yeah, thank you very much. Um, very interesting overview. And I actually ha also have a question, but I first want to uh, read you one question by Tamar Harashti. Um, and he's asking, I may have missed information. If I upload the data to the MP contribs, is my data stored there or have, or do I have to provide the storage? If it is stored on your server, what is the planned lifetime of the storage? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so that's a very good question. Uh, the storage is provided. Uh, we are currently storing our data at, on the AWS servers uh, through MP Contrips. Uh, in that sense, we are paying for that storage. Um, as long as the materials project remains a supported entity by the Department of Energy, we will um, um, guarantee that storage. It also comes with API. So all of those features, the database handling, the storage, and the API are, are items that come for free when you upload your data to MP Contrips. All right, thank you very much. I don't see any blue hand rising. Matthias, do you have a, no? I, I have a question as well. You, you mentioned that you have more than 500,000 KH uh, Zanes spectra. And yeah. if I remember correctly and listen correctly, then you said, if I upload spectra, um, I can then, or the system can decide which is the most likely compound that it corresponds to. Did I understand this correctly? Yes. Correctly. So this is experimental Zane spectra. So I can upload experimental Zane spectra and do the match. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, using a machine learning model. Um, and we are in the process of adding more data. So we started with KH Zane, but we actually have data for both l -Edge as Zane's as well as XSAS. So KH as well as l -Edge. And we are updating also our machine learning algorithm. So it's uh, going to be even more powerful in terms of of being able to identify the uh, local coordination environment and the uh, uh, valence state of your scattering center. So um, hopefully that will be very useful to the community. I know that a lot of people are using these kinds of spectra. Well, I, I, I can say also in the electron microscopy in the EELS community, this would be uh, very interesting, especially the L edges, which are easier to get than the K edges uh, for most elements. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any further questions? I don't see any. Okay. There is one uh, raised hand by Uwe Bergman. So Uwe, please. Hey, Uwe. Uh, hi, hi, Chris. <laughs> I, I, this is really fascinating and, and fantastic. In the Zane spectra, can you also, do you also have, let's say, if one has time, let's say a time sequence of ultra fast events in, an, in a compound, right? After, let's say, photo excitation or something, would it be possible uh, to update your Zane's database to have, let's say, um, optically excited uh, states in there as well. For example, there are these, you know, there's these photoactive um, systems and molecules. We haven't looked into that. Uh, we would have to spend some time to see how robust those calculations would be. My guess is that it would be quite difficult um, under the current, the current codes we're using. Uh, but maybe somebody like Julia could chime in and see if that's something that, that her code could support. Yeah, thank you. That, I, because I, well, it depends probably how big the structural change is, right? I mean, if it's a, if yeah. it's a very subtle change, it might be more difficult, but if it's a somewhat more substantial change or if one can put that into the, uh, I mean, into the parameters you use for your, your orbitals you use for the calculating the Zanes, I, I think this could be, uh, I'm thinking now of this, you know, high rep rate LCLS2, right? Because there will be all these time points. And if one could link them up with your uh, database and the machine learning would, would be phenomenal. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the future, right? Yeah. One step at a time. But but it's we good will to get know. There. So if, if any yeah. questions come up, I can refer them to you, to your group, to your team. For sure. We'll do our best. Also, Professor Ong at UC San Diego, his group has been heavily involved in the calculations of the, of the, of the Excel spectrum. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, there, there is another question that just came in um, by Moritz Tobarben. Um, hey, Moritz. You mentioned, hi. <laughs> you, you mentioned that you depend on funding from DOE to keep materials project online. For how long yeah. do you have the funds? So we were first uh, funded through a software center mechanism. Uh, that has a finite lifetime to it, at least the way it's implemented today. 
we were very fortunate that we, uh, two and a half years ago, were brought into the core programs of LBNL. They do not have a finite life term to them, but you still have to review well and you have to, um, you have to meet your, the, the, the expectations of your program managers and, and the current climate in, in, in the community. Uh, make sure that you're useful and that you're doing good science. Um, that being said, um, I, I think there is a future out there for uh, a broader, uh, broader sort of engagement with the community. Our user base and our, and our ability to interact with users is really what's making us powerful. It's really what sort of drives our innovation. What kind of properties do we calculate? What kind of data do we make available? Just like Uwe was asking for a particular set of data and interacting with those users. That's a tremendously untapped potential that I think could be a, a, a broader scope of what we're doing today. All right, thank you very much. Um, are there any further questions from anyone? I don't, I don't see any. Um, yeah, I guess, um, Matthias, do you want to say anything else? No, I think I should press thank to Christine again. Uh, it's good to see you all, even virtually. <laughs> yeah, it's good to see you guys.